All right, we are getting ready to start. If everybody could find their seat, we're getting ready to start. All right, so in this session, we have Sam Scott, co-founder, CTO Oso, who will be speaking to us about authorization patterns in GraphQL. Sam is the co-founder, as I mentioned, working on many secure or making security more accessible for developers. Sam is a cryptographer and an engineer by training and can discuss anything from trends in security policy as code to his contribution to TLS 1.3 to authorization in GraphQL. Please help me give Sam a warm welcome. All right, hello everyone. Um, so if you got hassled by a few of my colleagues, I'm sorry. We're, uh, we're kind of excited because today we just announced that Oso Cloud is generally available. So we're, sort of, we're all kind of having a lot of fun here in San Diego. Um, so you may have got some, uh, some sunglasses. This will be a, uh, it's gonna be a three -day, 3D presentation. Um, before we kick off, uh, I'd like to ask a little favor of everyone. Could everyone put their sunglasses on? I'm gonna take a bit of a selfie to kind of like celebrate Oso being here at, at GraphQL Summit. This is, this is exciting for all of us. Um, it's also going to help. My slides are pretty, pretty garishly horrible, so you might want to keep them on. All right, uh, let's go to selfie mode. Let's not fall off the stage. All right, is everyone ready? Three, two, one, super graph! <laughs> All right, thanks for, uh, thank you for humoring me. Uh, let's, let's get into the actual talk now. Okay, cool. So. A little bit cliche, but I'm going to start with a, you know, I'm going to start with a quote. So you know how they say in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. Well, that's kind of what this talk is about today. Um, it's going to be about sort of the, the theory behind authorization in GraphQL, but also the kinds of things I've seen in practice. Um, this comes from my experience as, um, as, the, as, you, as you heard, the co-founder and CTO at Oso. Basically, we build authorization for developers like you, uh, so you don't have to. And so through that, through that time, I've met with tons and tons of developers who are using GraphQL in, in various different interesting ways. Um, and so I'm going to speak about that. Uh, I'm actually not going to wear these. Um, so yeah, before, as you heard as well, before I was a CTO, I was a, a PhD in cryptography. So, and I kind of like slid from theory more into practice. And so this, this kind of like duality of theory and practice is a really like familiar topic for me. Um, so yeah, I hope you are going to learn a lot about authorization in GraphQL. So before I get into it, um, I know there's often a lot of confusion around authentication, authorization. I'll lay out some terms. So authentication, right, it's all about identity, identifying who the user is, maybe username and password, single sign-on, two-factor, all that kind of stuff. Authorization, piece that comes next, right? Now you know who the, us who the user is. What are they allowed to do? And uh, our focus at Oso in this talk is primarily going to be at what can the user do in your application, right? So for some examples, um, I hope most of you are familiar with GitHub. GitHub has a pretty robust authorization model. You can, have, you can be an owner or a member on or an organization. You can also have roles on repositories. You can be like contributors, maintainers, things like that. Uh, I really like GraphQL as an, uh, sorry, GitHub as an example because they also have a GraphQL API, so that gives us some nice examples to draw from. And then you have some like, more extreme examples. There's AWS IAM, the sort of, this massive system that gives you sort of unlimited customization around your authorization inside the AWS platform. Um, and then also some ones that maybe aren't quite so in your face, you know, Google Docs or Notion, where it kind of like seamlessly melts, you know, melts into part of your experience of the app, where you can like share documents with people and you can let them view or edit. Um, all of these, I think, great examples of uh, authorization and applications and kind of the range you can get. So why is this something worth talking about? Like, what's the, what's, what's, what's the point? Um, I mean, so on one hand, right, without authorization, it's, your app is kind of, it's, it's sort of anarchy, right? Anyone can do anything. You can just go and delete other accounts. Not a great situation. But for me, I, I prefer to focus on, the, on actually the user experience side of authorization, like how it, how it impacts your product. You know, if, if authorization is broken, your app is broken. People can't do things. They can't access stuff. If your authorization is buggy, people get frustrated and confused. Like, I'm sure all of you have had that moment where you're fighting permissions in some product, and you're like, you know what? 
everyone's an admin, let's get this over with, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Um, so like, to me, that's the stakes, right? It can, it, can be, you know, it can be vulnerable, but also it can just, it can just be really bad. Um, okay, so onto GraphQL. The first pattern I want to talk about is around authorization in the business logic layer. So if you're like me, the topic you're not too familiar about, you're just going to go ahead and Google it, right? GraphQL authorization. First result pops up, graphql.org, authorization. That sounds great, right? You go to this page, and there's this fantastic conceptual overview of how to think about authorization in GraphQL. It's got a nice example. It's got some motivation. Um, really fantastic document. I, I do mean this. And it leads with this like one golden rule. They, they say, delegate authorization to the business logic layer. Uh, there might be probably two parts of this that might need, might need some definitions, but it might be confusing. Uh, one, like, what does it mean to delegate authorization? And two, what is a business logic layer? So the, the term business logic layer in this context comes from another GraphQL org doc called Thinking in Graphs, where they sort of laid out this like, structure of layers to help people think about like, where GraphQL should fit into their app. Um, I have my own version of this, of this uh, diagram, so I can kind of like, doodle and draw on this. And so basically, you break it down into these like, different parts. You know, you've got this, like your API layer, which could be REST, it could be GraphQL, this business logic layer thing, and persistence layer. Um, what this is representing is actually like, the layers within your backend application. So it can be helpful to see this in a bit more context. Um, so on the left-hand side, right, you might have the, the client. It could be a web browser, it could be a you know, mobile client, whatever it is. And those clients are going to be making some kind of request to your backend. It could be REST. It could be GraphQL queries. Uh, the business logic layer is the piece that um, basically is the, you know, is the meat of your application, right? That's deciding like, what kinds of bits of data to pull together, what actions to do, what things to fire off. That's, that's where the business logic comes in. The persistence layer, you know, that's the piece that may reason write stuff to the database. So this is kind of like this conceptual framework and where business logic fits in. Okay, so suppose I wanted to authorize a request. Uh, let's start with REST, because it was on the left. Um, a user's trying to get access to some organization inside our GitHub application, right? They're trying to get the Acme org. Okay, so we might implement this. This is a bit, you know, somewhat basic, but you know, they look up the organization, and then you know, they authorize, okay, can the user read this organization? If they can't, we'll return null. Seems pretty straightforward. Similarly, for the GraphQL one query, they instead they query for you know, an org with ID Acme. Similar thing, we, you know, in our resolver now, we go and look up the org, we check, can the, user, can the user read it? If not, return null. Seems pretty straightforward so far, right? Now, the, the, problem, that, the problem that the, uh, you know, that GraphQL doc, the GraphQL org doc talks about, like why this is not so great, is because we basically duplicated that authorization logic between the REST API and the GraphQL API. It's maybe not too bad in this example where I have like one, you know, one route, one, one query handler, but um, you know, multiply that across your entire app, and suddenly you've got all these different pieces that need to stay in, um, to stay in sync. Because if, you know, if they fall out of sync, you check different permissions in different places, then your app might behave differently based on which API you speak to, and that's when you get into the situation where everyone becomes an admin because no one can use the app. And so basically, when, you know, they're coming back to that like delegate authorization to the business logic layer. That's what it means. It means take that authorize and like push it down. That's like part of your business logic. It should be you know in one central place. It shouldn't be mixed in with your uh, API handlers. So how that might look? Maybe you've got like a, a method that looks up the organization by ID, and that's basically where you should do the authorization. So then both REST and GraphQL APIs they can call the same business logic method, find by ID, and you know the authorization is applied. Uh, there's one, one extra thing I want to say on this pattern, this, um, this authorize method. You'll see me doing this a lot throughout the talk, just like magically putting authorization behind some API. Uh, that's kind of in part just to hide some of the details from you, but also, but also that's like a really important pattern I think you should all um, like think around for authorization. Uh, if, you heard it, if you went to Ash's talk earlier, he spoke about something very similar, like uh, having this kind of an API is what allows you to really just put your authorization logic somewhere else in like one place so that you, know, you only have one place to update it, you have like, one place to do logging, debugging, things like that. Um, even more importantly, if you go to like, uh, GraphQL Federation with subgraphs, then like, this API might be calling out to some other central service. So this like, authorized method, good thing to do, um, and you do that in the business logic. So OK, so the takeaway, first pattern, push authorization down to the business logic layer. I have sort of a, a little bit of an elaboration I want to do on that one pattern. So if instead of just looking for one org, we actually had like a query to get multiple, right, the first 10 organizations, the naive way to do that 
would be to I don't know, get, the, get 10 orgs from the database, go through each one, and check authorization. Um, what's bad about that is it's, it's pretty slow. You're doing authorization like 10 times in a row. And like, if one of them fails, what do you do? Do you return nine results? Do you return an error? Do you like, go and get another one from the database and play this game forever? And so basically, again, you want to follow the same advice from before, which is like push the authorization to the business logic layer. So how that might look, uh, maybe the authorization we want to implement is like you can only see orgs that you belong to. Uh, and so that's why I have like this, this filter in my um, imaginary, imaginary RM that like filters organizations by the user's orgs, something like that. This is what a lot of people like tend to do this like without really even thinking about it, you know, filtered by like an organization the user's in. Um, but it's a good pattern. Over time, though, this probably gets more complex. You have like more, more granular things you need to figure out. Um, at that point, it can be good to again introduce like a, a magic method to sort of put the authorization behind it uh, that can maybe just get all the organizations a user can, can see, and then you do that filtering. Um, so yeah, so what's really powerful about this, you can still do all kind, you know, sorting and filtering and uh, you know, aggregations and all that kind of stuff like over the data, and it's already been authorized. This works really well for both like list endpoints, also even that like single one as well. Like I could apply that same filter and then say and get me org blah, and if if they can't read it, it's just like it doesn't exist. So that's like a really nice pattern. Um, I think one that's really good to know about is like you know when you're thinking around like reading data. A really good way to think about the authorization part is like think of it as like a database level filter. And so you might you might redraw the diagram and have authorization as like little uh, layer down here between business logic and persistence. It's kind of another way to think of it. All right, I am under ten minutes in, and sounds like we're done, right? That's the theory of graphical authorization. That seems pretty pretty resoundingly good, right? I think we're done. Um, so, okay, in, in theory, that is all absolutely correct. And actually, in practice, a lot of what I just said is, is really the, like, the, the go-to thing to do. I think, like, as a default, that is how you should think about authorization in any application, GraphQL, REST, or whatever. Um, and for a long time, like, you know, I've been doing authorization for a while, and my co-founder had always been hassling me, like, we should do a GraphQL integration. I'm like, I don't think we need to. Business logic layer, it's fine. And then what happened is that we kept meeting people who are doing GraphQL authorization, and they were doing stuff in GraphQL. They were doing stuff in their resolvers. They were doing stuff in the schema. And I, so you know, I spoke with them and tried to figure out what was happening. Um, and so I have a few, there's a few things I learned from that and a few things I want to share today. Uh, before I do that, though, I'd kind of like to do an impromptu survey, because I kind of want to see from this audience as well like how well this matches up. So can I get a hand from everyone who is using GraphQL on the back end in some form? Federated, anything? Nice. So people on the stream. Pretty much the entire audience, good stuff. Okay, no, keep the hands up, keep the hands up. So now, okay, for those of you uh, who don't follow that like best practice of you know, separating resolvers and your business logic and stuff like that, keep your hands up. And maybe it's like everything's in the resolver, maybe just some things, maybe this is like that one special case that doesn't quite fit. Okay, pretty, pretty good. I'd say maybe like 10% of the room kept their hands up. Nice, okay, thank you everyone. Uh, so yeah, so basically, like what what I kind of learned is also no judgment, by the way, from that. That's <laughs> there's some great reasons for it. Let me get into them. So okay, there's some like exceptions to that like golden rule from before. Like number one, honestly, it's kind of easier in some ways to do authorization at the GraphQL layer, right? Like everything I just showed you before, where you have this like granular check on a specific resource, can they do this thing? Actually, takes like a lot of like practice and, and rigor that not. Most people don't do, especially like if you come from a REST world where you're like, I don't know, I checked the API route and that was enough. Like, the, the same is true in GraphQL. Like, we don't all have time to have like a full security team helping us structure like our authorization perfectly. So that's like one thing I've seen. Um, the second one is if you're like if you're a GraphQL first company, so you're not you're not trying to do like REST and GraphQL. You're like, no, we're all in GraphQL. We're building our app on top of GraphQL. Then that like rationale for like keeping the you know, reducing the duplication between the two like just disappears. And once that has gone, actually, and we'll see this in a second, there are some really, really compelling reasons to do the authorization in the GraphQL layer. The final ones, like I said, no judgment, because there's also a lot of good stuff happening here. The final one is like uh, doing authorization at the GraphQL layer um, or at the REST layer can actually help you with defense in depth. Right? So you might want to do some checks like check it on the mutation, right? This, you know, you often see some simple ones like just 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 make sure the user's logged in. Like in theory, it, you know, we're going to check them again later to make sure they have the right permissions. But like, you can do that defense in depth stuff. You can just make sure like you've at least in the ballpark of the right permissions, and then and then later check something else, and then maybe later do it at the database as well. So these are all good reasons. 
OK, so with that, I'm going to speak about my second pattern, which is doing authorization in that GraphQL layer. I'm primarily going to speak about doing it in like the resolver layer. There's like many different ways you can do this, um, you know, directives and middlewares. I'm, I'm going to pick just an example just to kind of give you the gist. OK, so suppose we have some mutations, um, create a repository, open an issue, things like that. Um, so we implement our resolvers, and, and you know, again, for one of those reasons from before, we have authorization right here in our resolvers. All right, so we have our magic method. We check, can the user create a repo? If not, throw an error, and so on. So again, this is like pretty simple, um, seems pretty clean, but it's actually it's a, it's still a little bit error prone, a little bit tedious to go through and do this in every single mutation, right? As your, your project grows, this gets spread throughout your code base. You split these up into different files. It can be hard to see what's going on. Um, you, know, you make a copy-paste error, and suddenly people can do stuff they're not supposed to. And so one pattern I've seen that can be a really nice uh, approach to address this is to implement a custom directive. The, so I'm not going to go into the details of, of how to implement this, but like the, the general idea is you have like a custom directive, like a check. Maybe it, you, you specify the permission you want to check and the resource it's on. And then what you can do is you can just like annotate your GraphQL schema with the permissions it should check. And like what's really nice about this, it's, you know, it's pretty similar-ish level of work to what we saw before, but it's like really leaning into the concept of like the GraphQL schema being this uh, like source of truth, the you know, declarative place to put things like permission checks. Because now anyone can go through that, like look and scan through it and be like, create repository, create repo, uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, and it's like a lot you could do with this, right? You could even ex you know, you could expose this stuff to, um, to end users. You could show them, hey, here's the level of, you, know, you could return like what role you need to access a thing, stuff like that. So this would actually be a really nice pattern. Um, so yeah, I think the takeaway from this one for me is like, there are some actually really compelling reasons to do that authorization in GraphQL, um, even, if, you know, even if that's not like the golden rule way of doing it. Uh, one, one caveat I do have, so we, we spoke about doing like authorization in the database as well. Uh, you can't really duplicate that in the resolver. It gets very messy. Um, believe me, I've tried to like try and get you know, the resolver to do the database filtering and pass the data background. You, you kind of get tangled up a bit. Um, so I, I tend to think of this one being really more suitable for like checking a mutation, checking access to a single thing, um, and like it, um, it's actually very complementary with that, like in your database approach. Again, defense in depth. Throw everything at it. All right. So I have a final pattern. This is a bit of a bonus one. Um, this is kind of one of my favorite ones because it comes back to what I was speaking about about user experience and making authorization in your app like honestly fun. The the general idea is extend your you know extend your entities with this permissions field. Basically, what this allows you to do is it allows you to kind of signal back to a client, you know, the web browser front end, whatever it is, the permissions a user has on a particular entity. And this allows you to build like really great UIs that know exactly what the user can do. Right? So you've you've got a UI and like, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that thing. I'm gonna like hide that whole tab. You don't have access to settings, you're not gonna see them. Or maybe you show show the thing, but you like gray it out, make it obvious, like you're not allowed to do that thing. Or maybe you return like a message that says, hey, you this you don't have permission to do this action. As soon as you start having this like extra field of permissions on your, uh, on your API, then you can really start building great UIs around it that, that help you know, users understand what they can and can't do. And there are examples of this out in the wild. So coming back to GitHub again, um, so you can, in the, in the GraphQL spec, you can, you can query, for example, on a repository for this field viewer permission. And basically what you get back is the sort of permission level that the current user has on that resource. So you can see I'm an admin of the OSO, uh, OSO repository, for example. So again, like all they need to do as a front-end developer now is take that field and be like, simple little like if or you know, React component that like hides something if you don't have the permission. You can build great UIs with just that information. I think this is a good pattern in general, but I think it's um, something that's very, I, I, get, I don't know, like natural or easy to achieve in GraphQL. Um, like the way you do this is you would just like, you know, you'd extend your type with a new resolver that, um, again, maybe calls into a method that can, you know, list all the actions that a user can perform on a resource. So again, if you have that, that nice API boundary, if you can do, uh, you know, authorization behind that API, you can get back all those permissions that a user has. Um, the way you might implement this, right, like in a, in a simple case, user has a role, he may return the list of permissions the role has. Um, as this gets more complex, it can get more involved. Uh, that's where you probably want to turn to like a uh, you know existing authorization solution. Something like Oso can kind of do this pretty nicely. 
So yeah, I, I really would love everyone to take this one away because I think this is such a great pattern that like everyone should be using. Um, I've been using this recently myself and building stuff out, and it just it makes front end development with authorization fun in a way that it's kind of surprising. Okay, so three takeaways. One, defaulting to authorization in the business logic layer, great approach, especially if you do the database level filtering for reads. That, that's really powerful. Number two, there's a, there's a time and a place for doing like custom GraphQL level authorization, and, it, and it, can, it can be really great to build those like schemas that have all this like rich information about permissions. Um, and then finally, like, yeah, consider extending your like entities with this permissions field so UIs can be built on top of them. Okay, cool, so that's everything I wanted to cover. Um, this is a pretty short talk. Uh, I might not have felt it. Sorry if it didn't. But uh, like authorization is a pretty deep subject. So if you want to like learn any more about this, so number one, uh, there's a blog post written by a colleague of mine, Patrick, which is sort of the um, origins of this talk, where he goes into each of these in more depth and like actually how to implement them, stuff like that. We also have a follow up post, uh, yeah, follow up post to it, which goes into depth on some of the federation patterns as well, which is nice. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about authorization in general, we have this uh, vendor neutral series of technical guides that just talk you through authorization concepts like what is modeling, what are roles, what are you know, ABAC and things like that. Um, and then finally, uh, yeah, as I said at the beginning, we just you know, announced the, our product is generally available today, also cloud, so we would appreciate your support if you want to go to the website and check us out, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, and if you'd like to see Oso in action, um, so I'm actually doing a demo in about half an hour or so, uh, and tomorrow as well, around basically what it looks like to integrate something like Oso Cloud with a Supergraph setup. So I had a lot of fun over the last couple of weeks building out an app with like multiple GraphQL um, APIs and then federating them together. And then after Matt's announcement this morning, I had to go and rewrite it for the GraphOS product, which took me like 20 minutes in fairness. So yeah, the Supergraph thing is pretty compelling. Um, but yeah, that should be a lot of fun, because you can see the multiple services, we're talking to each other, and like authorization is just, it's just happening. All right, so with that, I'm done. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, you might have to like, catch me on the way to the demo booth or in the, in the hallway. Um, yeah, thank you all for listening.